Hello and welcome to the audiobook reading of Three Friends Diner, read by Lexi Boyer. I hope you enjoy. To Jeremy Futas, PhD, Professor of Cultural Anthropology, University of California, Berkeley. Jeremy, I assume you've heard about the strange discovery made at 918 East 3rd Street, a converted warehouse located at the corner of 3rd and Weller Avenue in the middle of the Arts District in downtown Los Angeles. The building is currently undergoing renovations. Three weeks ago, construction workers noted a foul odor wafting through the property, seemingly coming from behind what they thought was a solid brick wall. Upon further investigation, however, it was discovered that the inside measurements of the property did not match up with the outside. There was, in fact, a 25 by 30 space completely unaccounted for, a secret room, so to speak, one inaccessible from any point inside the building or out. It was located at the far end of the property, along the wall forming the west side of Weller. With permission, the workers broke through the wall to access the otherwise inaccessible area. Immediately, they were floored by the overpowering stench of rotting meat. Bandanas over their noses, they entered the enclosure. They had expected to find an empty space. After all, the area had been walled off and unpenetrated for 20 years at least. Instead, they found a nice 16 millimeter camera smashed to bits. They found film equipment all destroyed, cracked lights, torn screens, C stands folded like paper clips, cheap looking framed paintings and a kitschy prop menu scattered like confetti and three bodies. Three decomposing bodies in a state too disturbing for description. Though the term half eaten had been thrown around, How the equipment or the corpses ended up there has yet to be determined. The walls and roof were not disturbed at any point, nor was there any sign of tunneling under the four-foot concrete floor. This bizarre discovery shocked the entire country. As of now, no one can explain how three dead people and a bunch of film paraphernalia just appeared within a completely walled-off space. But it was all the more shocking for me, personally, due to the contents of a handwritten account left for me by a former patient of mine. Her name is Catherine Sue. She voluntarily checked herself into the Marsvale Psychiatric Hospital, where I'm an on-call physician, several months ago and was discharged shortly before the horrific discovery on 918 East 3rd Street. I'm no longer in contact with the young woman. However, I believe you will find her testimony, a transcript of which I have enclosed, very intriguing. Sincerely, Larry Schler, MD. The Testimony of Katie Sue, January 5th, 2015, Marsdale Psychiatric Hospital. Just for the record, shooting Bella Cardone's movie at the Three Friends Diner wasn't my idea. I told her it was probably a scam, that no restaurant or in Los Angeles with two brain cells to rub together would have possibly charged us so little for a location so photogenic. Again and again, I insisted it was just wrong. I was right. I used to like being right. A little backstory. I'm Katie. I'm 21 years old. I used to be a junior at Cal State Northridge studying business administration and film production. I enjoyed the phone calls and the organizing and the paperwork filing that most film students hate, and I'd built up a modest reputation as a pre-production guru amongst my classmates as well as friends and acquaintances who attended other schools. Bella Cardone was one of such acquaintances, a 29-year-old international student from Italy I'd met at a third-rate horror film festival. She'd been employed at a television station in Rome doing something, but dreamed of writing and directing Hollywood movies. She was one of a dozen or so, mostly foreign, enrollees a year and a half into a two-year master's program at New York Film Academy. She was writing her thesis script at the time and asked me for help organizing the production of the film. Her script was about a starving artist working as a waitress who gets dumped by her boyfriend and has an existential breakdown in which she imagines herself poisoning her customers and getting tortured, accumulating in a series of flash cuts of her simultaneously slashing her wrists and drowning in the ocean. Typical pretentious grad student fare. We need to lock down five locations, an apartment, a beach, a park, and something that could function as a dungeon and a restaurant. The beach and park were relatively easy, and the classmate of Bella's had agreed to let us use her North Hollywood apartment for two days. Another classmate, a quiet little guy named Sandeep, 
discreetly told me about an S&M store with a basement dungeon they intriguingly rented out for movie shoots. I don't know how he came to be so, so familiar with such an establishment, and I'm not sure I want to know, but it proved ideal for our purposes, which left the restaurant a notoriously difficult one for student and independent filmmakers. So when I found a little French place in Encino on Craigslist, I got in touch with the manager and played the broke student card, so he granted us use of fresh of his restaurant for a night for a little over $400. I was ready to sign the papers, get the permit, and move on. It was two weeks before Bella's scheduled first day of shooting, and I had a million other things to worry about, from liability insurance to catering to talking to Northridge underclassmen and to helping out his G&E crew and PAs. Bella, however, thought $400 for a night was too expensive, and her maid convinced she could find a better deal. So she went on Craigslist herself and placed a restaurant wanted for student film ad. I'd put up a similar posting three weeks earlier, that's how I found the French place in Encino, and Bella received the exact same responses from the exact same people as I had. With one exception. An email from gsjepjpdg at me.com, which she forwarded to me. It read like this. Cheap location for film students. Restaurant in downtown Los Angeles, 35 Willer Ave, 100 for day. Respond to this email. We'll send you key. Pay on date of filming. Must be December 3rd afternoon. I was immediately suspicious. $100 for a day of filming seemed a little too good to be true. Then there was the poor spelling and the lack of contact information and the fact that when I tried to respond to the email, all I got was an error message. And then there was the key. The key turned up in Bella's on-campus mailbox two days after the email, enclosed in a stained brown envelope with no return address. And as if that wasn't creepy enough, it came with a scrawled note, key to three friends diner. I was ready to call it a scam and be done with it. But Bella thought we should at least go to the address given and talk to someone there. If it was real, she argued, it was too good a deal to pass up. Movies are expensive and we were already pushing her budget. So I agreed to go with her and Hamed Shirazi, the cinematographer, to 35th Weller Avenue, which, it turned out, was in the middle of the Arts District. I have a love-hate relationship with the Arts District. It's a cool place to go, meet a friend at her new loft. There's some nice restaurants and amusing wall art, and the dissonance created by graffiti-coated trash cans, barbed wire, and long, smelly lines outside the social services building, sharing a block with Yoda, yoga studios, BMWs, and a boutique shop um, hawking 80 bucks vintage baby sweaters is ironically poetic. But the streets are one way and parking is not existent. I ended up driving in a triangle for 15 minutes before giving up and pulling into a $10 flat rate lot. Weller Avenue wasn't a street so much as it was a glorified driveway. A short, narrow alley that branched off of 3rd Street and dead-ended. A large L-shaped building occupied the east and north sides of Weller. It appeared to be a closed nightclub in the process of being converted into an art gallery. The blacked out windows were covered with torn, dirty stickers advertising shows long since played and bands long since broken up. Graffiti artists, the gang affiliated kind, not the art foundation kind, had had their way with both the seafoam green walls and the ratty trash dumpster abandoned in the corner. The dingy gray warehouse, which functioned as the west side of Waller, 918 East 3rd Street, looked completely unoccupied. A sign hung in the window. The building had apparently been bought by East River Development. I recognized the name. My realtor father knew some people who worked for that company. They bought old commercial properties and converted them into trendy, pricey apartments. The most prominent visual, however, was the mural painted on the north wall, depicted the head and chest of a woman, face tilted eastward. The woman had tan skin, ruby red lips, and flowing hair in varying shades of blue periwinkle at the tips, darkening to a deep lavender at her scalp. Her eyes were closed. In the background, some distance behind her, was what appeared to be an orange grove. It was a beautiful painting and strangely mesmerizing. If you looked at the woman one way, she seemed young and innocent, sporting a demure grin. Then, if you cocked your head or blinked, lines appeared on her cheeks and her lips rearranged themselves into a pouty sneer. I saw only one door leading into the gray building. It was a very shabby door 
of splintery, untreated wood with a brass doorknob and a keyhole. No business name, no street number. This couldn't possibly be the restaurant from Craigslist. Three Friends Diner, I guess it was called. How did anyone ever find this place? I was so puzzling when Bella and Hamed found me. Bloody hell, Hamed barked in lieu of greeting. Where's the restaurant? Here, according to the phone, I said, I'm willing to bet money someone's messing with us. Bella didn't seem too concerned. Her eyes were fixed on the mural. So pretty, she exclaimed. Can we film? I shrugged. I'm not sure. We might run into some copyright issues, and it doesn't look like we're going to be filming here at all since we're not looking at a restaurant. Bella frowned at me and took the key out of her purse. She walked to the wooden door. Here? She asked. I don't think so, I said. There's no sign of anything. I mean, you could try it, but I'm really doubting that key's going to fit into that. Bella turned the key and pulled at the knob. With a creak, the door opened. Hamed and I rushed to her, and together, we stepped inside. I heard Hamed running his hand across the wall, and then the room was illuminated by a warm, golden light. We found ourselves staring at Three Friends Diner. It was perfect. It was a larger space than I'd assumed it would be. Rectangular shaped, the kitchen jutting out from the north wall. Behind the kitchen was a small corridor leading to the bathroom and a little room that could function as dry storage. The walls were painted that particular shade of deep red that looks beautiful on film. And the tables and chairs and diner style booths were a nice contrast in black and gray. And each table was adorned with a salt and pepper shaker, an empty bottle of ketchup, and a vase of plastic lilies. Don't get too excited yet, I said to Hamed, who was exclaiming one of the series of stained glass lamps from which light was emanting. We don't know how much juice you've got to work with. That's the beauty of it, he said gleefully. I don't even need that much juice. If we come a bit early and switch out all the bulbs, I could use the lamps as practicals. Plus, this place obviously isn't open yet, which means I'm not sharing power with anything. He was right about that. The freezers and refrigerators were empty and unplugged. The storage room was empty. There wasn't even a plate or a cup or a scrap of food to be found. It was definitely a new restaurant, the latest in the uh, avalanche of trendy urban eateries that had sprung up in the last few years as the art districts gentrified. Of course, it was hard to find. That would lend an air of mystery to the diner. The impression of exclusivity attracted Twitter following. I love it, Bella announced. Can you get a permit? I tried to talk her out of it. Something about the Three Friends Diner made me nervous, made the little hairs on the back of my neck stand up. But it was exactly what Bella had been looking for, and Matt had already started planning out shots, and the little hairs on the back of my neck didn't stand a chance against cheap, gorgeous, and logistically ideal. The restaurant wasn't open yet, which means we could shoot during the day, decorate how we wanted, and place the camera anywhere without worrying about being in anyone's way. December 3rd, the date the mysterious proprietors had insisted on, was our scheduled sixth day of shooting. Don't look under the horse you get, Bella told me. I think she meant don't look a gift horse in the mouth. That saying is a reference to the Trojan horse, given as a token of surrender by the Greeks during the Trojan War. I don't know why people keep repeating it, because if the Trojans had looked in the horse's wooden mouth, the Iliad might have ended a little differently. As I said before, I'd been forced to park in a $10 lot, and, as luck would have it, the attendant's iPhone was malfunctioning, so I couldn't pay with my card. I had no cash. The attendant directed me to a convenience store in Almeida that apparently had an ATM. It was getting dark, and I was not thrilled about having to run around downtown all alone. A trendy neighborhood six blocks from Skid Row is still a trendy neighborhood six blocks from Skid Row. The convenience store stuck out like a gold tooth, a little scrap of what the neighborhood used to be wedged between a cafe and a construction site. A cracked neon sign branded it Almeida Mart. The ice cream fridge was stuffed with La Mochiana popsicles, and the cash register had sat behind a pane of bulletproof glass. I engaged in battle what must have been the slowest ATM known to man and was so preoccupied with mentally cursing the loading screen that I failed to notice the sole other customer in the shop. Need to pay for parking? He asked. I turned. The man standing behind me was obviously homeless. He wore grime cake jeans and a staked military service jacket, and his leather leathery face demonstrated the dullness of days with no soap. I nodded and smiled. You a tourist? I shook my head. Student filmmaker, actually. My friend's going to shoot at this restaurant on Weller. 
Immediately, I doubted the wisdom of sharing that piece of information. I didn't want him to show up and beg for change, but his unshaven face fell, and his tone became one of alarm rather than anticipation. There's no restaurant on Weller, he murmured. That's just Bessie. I giggled. Bessie? He nodded. That's what folks around here call her. Old folks say she can change things, make things appear and disappear. He leaned in, narrowed his eyes, and dropped his voice to a cons conspiratorial whisper. If I was you, I'd stay away. They say it eats 20 years for one day. Bessie comes corporeal and feeds. I was about to ask him to elaborate, to explain exactly who Bessie was and why I should be afraid. But right then, the shop proprietor noticed the homeless man and yelled at him in what I had deduced were not nice words in Spanish. He booked it, and by the time the ATM coughed up my cash and I was back on Almeida, he'd disappeared. On my way to the car lot, I passed Weller. The blue-haired girl was right where I'd left her, standing in front of the two-dimensional groves of trees in a three-quarters profile, facing westward towards the door of the Free Friends Diner, eyes closed. Was she Bessie? Then fear washed over me like a cold shower and I ran. I threw a 20 at the parking attendant and got out of there as fast as I could. Something about that mural had scared everything out of my subconscious. Halfway to the 405 freeway, I figured it out. She, Bessie, was facing the wrong way. Bella's first five days of filming went surprisingly well. So well that when I arrived at Three Friends Diner for the sixth and final day, December 3rd, I forgot I was scared of the place. Crew call was one. Ahmed had already been there for an hour switching out light bulbs and loading equipment with Esteban the grafter and two grips, Miguel and a new girl who said her name was Andrea. Our grip truck was parked out front, partially obscuring my view of the mural but I could tell that Bessie was facing northeastwards towards the club turn gallery as she had been the first time I saw her. Of course, it would have been dark that night and I'd been scared and alone. I'd seen things that weren't really there. I made my way through the obstacle course of lights and C stands, set up my iPad at an unused table, and worked on the equipment drop-off schedule as crew members filtered in. I heard Katie's voice at least a minute before she and Bella walked through the door. God, that chick was loud. Bossy, too. No wonder she was such a good assistant director. Then came Vina, the production designer, carrying a large box of prop house framed pictures and the menus she did not designed. Nayari, the first camera assistant, set up the Ari where her lackey du jour loaded the film. Then two more grips, Pete and Ryan. Kaylee and Michelle, the freshman PAs. Lisa, the script supervisor, Dante, the sound guy, and finally Ming, the makeup artist. Then the actors came, and then Hamed and the guys were setting up lights for the master shot, then Kadia was calling for last looks, and then we were pushing in for close-ups. The first four hours went as smoothly and productively as we, as we had any right to expect, and for a short time, we entertained the possibility of finishing early. We were an hour ahead of schedule when we broke for lunch, everyone talking and laughing and enjoying themselves. That's when things started getting weird. Right after lunch, as we were picking ourselves up and resuming our work, one of the freshman PAs, Michelle, went to use the bathroom. A minute later, there was a blood-curdling scream. Ryan dropped a C-stand, Harry nearly dropped a lens, Hamed and Esteban took frantic steps towards the bathroom as Michelle sprinted down the hall back towards us. Who was in the storage cabinet, she cried. We all looked at each other. Seriously, Michelle demanded. This isn't funny. You knocked me over. Michelle, Katia asked, what are you talking about? Michelle was trembling. She looked ready to cry. I went to the bathroom, she said, and I heard this thumping coming from the storage cabinet that's back there. Someone was pounding on the door. We didn't hear anything, Hamed said. Someone was like ramming against the door, Michelle repeated. So I opened it, and someone ran right into me and ran towards you guys. She sobbed. Hamed narrowed his eyes. You sure, Michelle? Hamed asked. Because we were all out here, and no one came running from the bathrooms. He was wearing a black hoodie, Michelle insisted. I looked over the room to see if anyone was missing. Nope. Seventeen crew members, four actors none of whom were wearing a black hoodie, all inside a restaurant with only one entrance. You didn't see who it was? I asked Michelle rather stupidly. Obviously not, she shouted. It happened really fast. I just saw a black hoodie and really pale, really white skin. 
We couldn't solve the mystery. Michelle was really shaken up. One of the grips, Miguel, offered to drive her back to Northridge. He said he had to go too because he had afternoon classes. But it was hard to miss the tremble in his voice or the dampness of his palms. And suddenly Kaylee, the other PA, also had classes she'd forgotten to mention and tagged along with them back to campus. Three hours after the incident, we set up for our last shot in the dining area before moving to the kitchen. Though we th- come to the unspoken agreement that Michelle was either looking for attention or smoking pot in the bathroom, everyone was a little bit on edge, and that had slowed us down. To speed things up, I offered to help Vina dress the kitchen. She'd brought cutting boards, utensils, bread, lunch meat, and enough restaurant necessities to make the empty kitchen look like a busy back of house. At one point, she ran to her car to fetch some plates she'd brought from the 99 cent store. I was arranging knives on a knife block. I accidentally dropped one that skidded across the floor and got stuck under one of the large industrial refrigerators. I knelt down and reached under the refrigerator to grab it. As I did, I heard a crack behind me. A door opening on stubborn hinges. I straightened up and turned around, still on my knees. A blast of cold air hit me in the face. I was staring at an open freezer, ice caked against the back of the door and the walls. There were bodies in the freezer. Old, decomposing bodies. Wrinkled, leathery skin peeling off of yellowed bones. Bones that were oddly compromised, shattered, pulverized. Greenish mold clinging to the remains of brain matter cradled in the cracked skulls. The putrescent smell of rotting flesh. I closed my eyes and screamed, and screamed, and screamed, and screamed. Katie, what the heck, Katie? I heard Hamed's voice, felt his hand on my arm shaking me. I opened my eyes. The freezer was empty, empty and turned off. I looked up to see Bella and Vina standing above me. The rest of the crew was crowded around the kitchen entrance or staring through the window that separated the area from the dining room. Sorry, guys, I stammered, heart still racing. I I thought I saw a rat. Did I ruin the shot? Hamed shook his head. We're done. You sure you're okay? I nodded. Um, can I talk to you and Bella and Katie outside? The three muttered in agreement, and we started across to the dining room to the door as the rest of the crew set up the lights and camera in the kitchen. I had to tell them. We had to leave. Now, someone, something, was trying to impress on us that we weren't welcome. I thought I saw dead things in the freezer. I started quite pathetically. It was on, and it was cold, and there was a smell. Bella's eyes widened. Hamed cocked his head, frowning. Katie crossed her arms. I mean... I continued. I know it was just a hallucination, but it felt so real, and I'm not schizophrenic, and the thing with Michelle, and I think we should leave. There's something really going wrong here. I expected them to laugh at me or treat me like a patient in a psych ward. They did neither. Yeah, this place is starting to creep me out too, said Hamed. For starters, where are the bloody owners? Who hands a stranger a key to their business? Either they're mental or they've got some ulterior motive. He lowered his voice. And I'm getting these sensations, like somebody's watching us. Bella and Katie nodded. They felt it too. We can find another restaurant, I told Bella. All we need is the kitchen. We can easily cheat that. Make it look like it's the same place. I'll do whatever you want me to do, Hamed said to her, but I think we should consider packing up early. Bella looked at Kadia, then Hamed, then me. Her expression softened for a second, then she set her jaw. We wait one hour, she said. No problems, we film. We decided not to tell the crew and the one remaining actrix about the agreement we've come to out of fear that they'd panic, make a big deal out of what could have been nothing more than the effect of darkness on a big city. But several of them were undeniably scared and looking for an excuse to leave. As soon as the four of us walked back through the door, Nari and the nameless second AC walked out. We were too immature for them, Nari told Kadia. Dante, the sound guy, asked Bella if he could head out early since we didn't need to sync any sound for the kitchen scene. Two hours earlier, he'd been insisting on staying to get various kitchen sounds and the lights were set up and the blocking was rehearsed and last looks were called for. We found that Ming, the makeup artist, had quietly packed up her kit and left. No big loss. The actress was perfectly capable of applying the simple makeup design herself. Pete, one of the grips, was fairly adept at pulling focus, and Hamed conscripted me to hold the slate. 
and our agreed upon hour had passed and nothing scary had happened. Finally, Hamed flipped the camera on and Bella called action. The actress unenthusiastically smeared mayo onto bread, stacking lunch meat and lettuce, and smiled evilly. She turned to grab the poisonous cleaning solution from under the sink, and the lights went off. Somewhere in the pitch darkness, someone shrieked. There was a bump and a thud, and then the dining room lamps were all on. Esteban had found the light switch. Someone ran by me, Lisa cried out. Who brushed against me? It couldn't be an outage, Hamed said to one of the grips. The house lights work fine. Seriously, Lisa sobbed. Who pushed me? Hey, Esteban yelled. Guys. We all pushed our way into the dining area. The grip crew had plugged the five lights we were using for the kitchen scenes into five different electrical outlets amongst the table. The power cables were spread out, lying across the carpet like a spider web, so as not to draw too much electricity from one spot. Every cable had been severed, sliced down the middle, perfect, clean cuts as though accomplished with a sharp knife. Who did that? Katia snapped, trying and failing to disguise her distress. Because she knew that all ten crew members had been in the kitchen, and that no one person could have cut all five cables exactly at the same time. Everybody out, now, Hamed demanded. Now! Nobody needed to be told twice. We pushed through the wooden door and convened on the sidewalk under the closed eyes of the blue-haired mural girl. The Northridge students huddled together. Kedia paced. Venna glared with her arms crossed. And Bella attempted to regain some control over her compromised film set. We can't leave equipment, she told anyone who bothered to listen. Forget this crap, Vina sneered. I'm leaving. She stormed off. The actress threw Bella a helpless look, mumbled, call me, and started after Vina. I looked at the four remaining Northridge underclassmen, Andrea, Lisa, Pete, and Ryan. Miguel was going to give us a ride, Ryan said. I took the bus, Lisa stammered. Take them home, Hamed said to me. I'll stay and help Bella pack up. I can stay too, Katie said. Esteban nodded at them. Okay, cool, I said. I'll come back and help you guys finish up after I drop them off. Give me an hour or so. No one spoke the entire way back to campus. The silence was punctuated only by Lisa's occasional sob. The two guys stared out their respective windows. I left them outside the dorms and turned my car around and headed back towards the 405. I couldn't wrap my head around what I had just experienced. Some astrologic party had lured us to the free three friends diner, left a key with a group of complete strangers, demanded we film today, the third, and they hadn't even bothered to show up the, to collect the suspiciously unsubstantial amount they'd asked as a payment. Why? To mess with us? Were we on some kind of hidden camera show? Was there a trapdoor or second entrance we didn't know about? Maybe there'd been a projector hidden in the kitchen, creating the disturbing image of dead decomposing corpses in the freezer. But how to explain the smell, or the cold, or the hooded specter that had produced loud knocks on the storage room door that only Michelle could hear? On to explanation B. We had become victims of the specter the homeless man had called Bessie. She was a ghost or a demon, and we were trespassers on her property. Then why not start with the big stunt, the severed cables? Why the systematic approach, scaring one person at a time? And this poltergeist theory didn't explain who'd led us to the Three Friends Diner or why. Led us there to scare us away. Three Friends Diner. As I merged onto the 101, four minutes after midnight, I'd figured it out. One hand on the wheel, I called Bella three times, then Hamed twice, then Katia, then Esteban. Every single time, I was sent directly to voicemail. I left message for them, pleading, screaming messages, begging them to forget the equipment and run as far away from Three Friends Diner as their legs could carry them. Then I called 911 and sobbed to the dispatcher that my friends were in grave danger at 35th Weller Avenue. She calmly assured me that there that help would be there in 10 minutes. I got there first. The streetlights up and down the block had at some point gone out, so as I found my way to 35th Weller Avenue with only my phone and the moonlight to guide me, the dim bluish beam cast by my cell phone fell onto the sea foam green east wall, then open and a floated grip truck, and finally on Hamed. He like crumbled on the asphalt, a pool of dark liquid expanding around him. I ran to him, screaming his name over and over. He didn't respond. I saw his chest rise and fall feebly as I knelt beside him and felt a faint, carotid pulse. 
I rolled him onto his back. There was a large cut on the side of his head. His hair was matted with blood. His left arm hung at an odd angle. And the most distressing injury he'd acquired, the one responsible for most of the blood, was a series of five deep lacerations into his right bicep. The muscle was torn and the shattered bone was visible through the mess of ribbon, skin, and ground meat fatty tissue. The positioning of the lacerations was consistent with the placement of five fingers latched onto his upper arm. Five fingers with very long, very sharp claws. I tore off my jacket and tied it around his arm like a tourniquet. My consciousness had kicked into overdrive. I operated on quick flashes of disconnected logic. Something had attacked Tamed. It was gone. It was gone? Bella, Kadia, Esteban, where were they? I stood up, help was on the way, and there wasn't a whole lot I could do for Hamed until the paramedics got there. But the rest of them were still in the Three Freds diner, and my suspicions were justified. I ran to the door, but the door wasn't there. I was staring at a gray, unbroken wall. I dashed to the corner of the dead end, then to the sidewalk, skewering the length of the wall with my phone. I ran back and forth, again and again, feeling the hard concrete with my fingers. Nothing. The one entrance to the Three Friends Diner was just gone. Then the streetlights came back on. I took a step back and my terrifying impression was confirmed. I was on Waller. I was facing the right way. There was no door. In the distance, I thought I heard sirens. I looked up at the mural, the pretty blue-haired girl with closed eyes, standing in front of a citrus grove. She was gone too. In her spot was a shriveled old woman, skin dotted with sickeningly detailed moles and age spots. Her hair was the filthy, stringy, disheveled mane of a homeless woman. Her open mouth took up the entire length of her cheeks, showing off black, rotten, knife-like teeth dripping blood. A lot of blood. Blood that ran down the seafoam green wall like rainwater pooling on the asphalt below. Her eyes were open, her bloodshot, yellow eyes, her dilated pupils flashing maniacally, those bulging, staring, impossibly detailed eyes. This was no spray paint. Her eyes were real. Then her foot-long pupils shifted, and I swore her fang smile grew even wider. She was looking at me. This was Bessie. I don't remember the cops showing up, or the fire truck, or the paramedics. I didn't notice them lifting Hamed onto the gurney or loading him into an ambulance. I had no recollection of the back of the second ambulance, or the psych ER, or the questions I answered for the doctors, or the drugs. They tell me I was crying and laughing at the same time, that I kept on repeating, she only wanted three. All I know is that I woke up 23 hours later in the tiny detox room of a private mental hospital my parents had me transferred to. I stayed there for the remaining 49 hours. I was under 5150 hold, then went home to La Crescenta with my family. The last I heard, Hamen had regained consciousness and could speak short words like hi or yes. This is a good sign. The brain damage could be less severe than doctors initially thought. His memory's shot, of course. He can't remember traveling to America, much less what transpired the night he sustained his injuries. He was lucky, if such a word could possibly apply to his situation, that his left shoulder had taken the brunt of the impact when he hit the wall. He cracked his head on the asphalt at a lower velocity. The doctors weren't quite sure what to make of him. His wounds suggest something through him, like a discarded Barbie doll, against the east wall of the club turned gallery. I told the police everything, from the strange email and the key to the mural's horrifying transformation. Except the email had disappeared from both my computer and Bella's, which had been confiscated by the police as evidence. The key, too, had been misplaced and never found. And the mural in the crime scene photos was the same mural it had been before the inexplicable night. The lovely profile of a blue-haired girl with closed eyes. They were also confused when I referred to 35 Weller Avenue as a diner. For no diner existed there, nor had it ever at any time in the past. 35th Weller Ave... Weller Street wasn't a real address. There had never been a side door to the building at 918 East 3rd Street, and the building had been completely unoccupied for six months. I insisted, I described in minute detail, the deep red walls and the untouched kitchen and the little vases of flowers on every table. I begged the cops to look at the footage we shot, but that would be impossible, I learned. Our camera was missing, as was half of our equipment. Everything that hadn't been loaded into the grip truck. 
as was Bella Cardone and Esteban Serra and Katia Milosevic. The three had not been seen since the night I'd been found raving and Hamed half dead. Their credit cards had not been used and the cars were still parked on the streets in the arts district. Their phones were all off. The cops spoke to the other crew members. I hope they corroborated my story. They designated Hamed's assault as an animal attack and the disappearance of Bella, Esteban, and Kadia as a likely attempt at visa overstaying. They kept a lot of details from the public, and I'm sure they didn't want to explain how a mountain lion managed to grow an opposable thumb and pick up and throw a man at 60 miles per hour against a wall. As for me, I'm now a voluntary inpatient at the Marsdale Psychiatric Hospital, undergoing treatment for PTSD and an unspecified mood disorder. It's okay here, they let me smoke, and no one freaks out when I wake up in the middle of the night screaming. Too late, I understood the significance of the name, Three Friends Diner. Three Friends. The homeless man was right. Bessie is real. She can make things appear and disappear. The key, the door, the diner. She's something inhuman and evil. Something that the man sacrificed. She lured us there. She played her little games, chasing away a few crew members at a time until she had a manageable number. Then she tossed Hamed aside like a chicken bone and took her prize. She only wanted three. Three friends. Bella, Kadia, Esteban. Two, Jeremy Futes, PhD professor of cultural anthropology university of california berkeley jeremy as a postscript to my last letter i should add that the three bodies found in the secret room of 918 east third street have been identified as the three missing foreign students bella cardone katia milicevic and esteban sarah the p Police are still at a loss as to how the unfortunate young people met their end, though evidence suggests that they were mauled by an extremely large, extremely violent animal. We also learned that the building at 918 East 3rd Street, which suspiciously housed Three Friends Diner, was previously renovated in the early 1990s. According to building plans, the secret room in which the bodies were found was originally designated as a storage closet but the company later decided to seal the area off completely, likely after three overnight workers were found dead there. Their deaths were attributed to an explosion, an explosion that no one saw or heard, and one that did no structural damage. The three workers were found dead on December 4th, 1994, which is intriguing because the three students, Katie's crewmates, were reported missing as of the early hours of December 4th, 2014. According to Katie, the email she received stated that the crew must film at Three Friends Diner on December 3rd afternoon. A typical film day is 12 hours, putting their end time at shortly after midnight, December 4th. I believe Katie's homeless man said something about one day every 20 years. I looked through pictures and books, old copies of LA Times, slides, news footage, etc. I have included several of these for your procedural. In every single one since the warehouse at 918 East 3rd Street first opened in 1920, the mural of the woman with blue hair is present. No artist has ever taken credit for this mural, and it's always the same, never dulled by the rain or the sun or time. Well, not exactly the same. Sometimes the girl faces west, and sometimes she faces east. Sincerely, Larry Scher, MD. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for the follow-up of this story. Hi, I'm Tanner Wagner and I'm here discussing the Three Friends Diner Horror Story with Lexi Boyer. So Lexi, since we're going to be talking about the psychological part of horror in this story, what was your favorite part of it? I love how they took the time to build up the suspense so that the payoff in the end was like a lot nicer for the reader like the climax was peak horror it was just amazing to read over now me myself i am not is not a fan of horror i am not a fan of horror but lexi is <laughs> i don't know why but she is either way these types of short stories that are like crowdsourced they're they're some of my favorite stuff to read b just because of the creativity they get to have like being a smaller name the creativity with the horror is a lot better in the smaller stories i did i do think the story was pretty creative in that aspect Pr on the as well mostly on the aspect of how it became a 
from someone else telling the story to a first-hand account of what happened. Yeah, that that was definitely very useful to get the full effect across, because if the whole story was talked about from, like, a second-hand account, we wouldn't have really... Gotten to know the characters. Yes, yeah. the true terror and horror of what happened at the Three Friends Diner, it wouldn't have been translated through properly unless it was the first-hand account that we got. Oh, yeah, definitely not. With how much evidence Katie provided, there's no way. Yeah, we wouldn't have been able to get that from, like, a second-hand person. Also, in case you didn't listen to the story, Katie's the main character. Yes, but let's talk about Bessie. She was... The... Creepy. The demon, I guess, that was responsible for the events that happened at Three Friends Diner. But, as explained in the story, she can change things. Make things appear, disappear, and just... Somehow make a key appear. Yeah. So, Bessie, in the story, she's kind of introduced to us by, like, a homeless man who kind of explains what she does and that she always demands a sacrifice December 4th? 3rd. December 3rd afternoon. Yeah. Which is actually, by when we were recording this, it was yesterday afternoon. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, no, Sunday afternoon. Yeah. But... They they demanded the filming be done on December 3rd because the typical film shoot day is 12 hours, making their end time on December 4th, which is when Bessie becomes corporeal, she feeds, she takes her sacrifice, and then she dips. Also, something I noticed, we have not been talking about the guy at the end that guy is head bashed in, basically. I don't remember oh, his name. Yeah, um, Hamed, I believe. All we know is that most of these characters in this were foreign exchange students. Yeah, a lot a lot of the characters were foreign exchange students, which I do think was pretty interesting. Like, having the foreign aspects of everything, it kind of added to mm-hmm. the story. Like, having them not quite... I guess... Not quite there, but there at the same time. Yeah. And at the end, like, when Hamed was attacked, he lost his memory. He didn't remember even coming to America. He lost most motor functions, though, didn't he, for a while? Yeah, for a bit. But having that, it allowed, like, police to come up with an explanation of why they all went missing. Which I I do think was good writing. Being able to... Come play, up with play it uh, off, I guess. Yeah, come up with the cover story. Yeah, e- even though it wasn't true, like ha- being able to find that cover story, it it was definitely very useful. But the doctor who included the testimony, he said that they could not explain what happened, so they just wrote it off as a missing persons, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and then when they actually found the bodies, when the construction workers were tearing down everything... They opened up the case again. They opened up the case again because they found the three dead bodies, and they chalked it up to a bizarre animal attack, which... Somehow a mountain lion getting into the center of Los Angeles, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Or somewhere near there. But either way... Where were we going Who knows? (laughs) Either way, Bessie can just make things appear, disappear. Her being a demon in this story that kind of, like, haunts over Three Friends Diner, I think that was a really smart play because she was depicted as this graffiti art on the wall. She was first seen as this beautiful young woman with just really soft features And then as the story progressed and we got to learn more and more about her, her appearance changed. Like, whenever you squinted, she looked kind of older and, like... And at the middle of the story, she became more older that you didn't have... Old enough where you didn't have to squint to see it. Yeah. And then right at the very end, like, she just became this withered face. Like, if you ever watch, like... Tangled. Think like Mother Gothel right at the end when she loses all her youth. Like her face just got wrinkled and evil and just... Or an easier way to explain it, kind of like zombies if you've ever watched The Walking Dead. 
Yeah. But either way, she showed her true colors. Her eyes were, like, real. Bright yellow, like Anakin Skywalker's. Yeah. They, they were real eyes. They were coming out of the art. And I feel like that's super, really important. Just because it shows off that horror, everything. Because how terrifying is it to see wall art with real eyes? Like... That's terrifying. Yeah. Just thinking about it. Like, Bessie definitely... She definitely knew how to scare Katie into making it seem like she was insane by showing her true colors right at the end. And I I do think that was a really smart move. Also, if I remember correctly, Katie willingly went into a me- mental hospital. Yeah, she checked herself in just because... Um, she ended up having, like, an undiagnosed mood disorder and PTSD. I wonder why PTSD. Oh, wait. <laughs> the horror. <laughs> but I, I do think all the parts of this story, it definitely came together very well at the end. Also, here's another thing that I just noticed. A mountain lion managed to grow an opposable thumb and pick up and throw a man at 60 miles per hour against a wall. Hmm. Yeah, the police explanations for what happened weren't exactly accurate, but... Especially when a mountain lion managed to grow an opposable thumb. Yeah. But as ridiculous as the reasoning for what happened... I, I do think that the story was very well written. It was a very fun read, which you can go read yourself at, um, I believe, creepypastafandom.com. Like, you just look up Three Friends Diner, you can find the story, read it yourself. It's an amazing read. I highly recommend it. I do, too, because I don't like horror, but, like I said, but I liked it. Yeah. Those smaller stories on creepypasta sites, they're, they're going to be some of the scarier ones, just because of... The creativity with it. Well, I think that's all. Mm-hmm. Thank you for listening. Yep, thank you guys for listening. And tune in again soon. <laughs>